Hey, Ian. Hey, Jared. Welcome. Like I was saying to Jonathan a minute ago, thank you for joining me today. That's our pleasure. Oh, you're on site right now in the factory in the Netherlands, correct? Uh, this is actually our production shop in just outside of Nelson, British Columbia, Canada. Oh, cool. Much closer than so, I uh, Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We are at the production site uh, here in just outside of Nelson, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, here we have uh, our biggest printer. Um, this is the uh, nine axis uh, robot on a beam and towers. And we actually have a print that we just finished um, about 10 minutes ago. So if you want to come in a little closer, we'll show you the uh, print. Yeah, sure. This print here is um, essentially a non-horizontal print. So uh, you can see that the layers at the bottom start horizontal, but then as the print increases, it's actually uh, starting to incline. And so and this is- uh, by, Are there the same number of layers on the high side and the low side, and you just increase the width of the layers on the right side? Or are there more layers on the right side? It's the exact same number of layers on the one side as the other. The layer height increases, but the bead width stays the same. Oh, really cool. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to come get a closer look, you can see that the uh, bead here is has a pretty nice finish. And um, what we're doing is we're actually modulating the speed of the, the tool path to make sure that we keep the same um, bead width. Yeah, especially for the corners, that looks really good. And then uh, up here is the robot, yeah. What's the advantage to having nine axis versus six axis printer? Well, well seventh axis is a pretty obvious one because it allows you to go across the, the X and would otherwise just be the Pac-Man shape of a regular six axis robot. You've seen actually quite a few other companies doing that. Royal's got one, BAM has one, uh, Vertical now has one. Uh, the eighth axis is really one of our biggest advantages because we can go vertical in much taller parts. And the ninth axis is rotation, and that's really just to help us get as much build volume in one part as possible. But unfortunately, we have yet to come up with a, a part that we can test on the system yet. So it's still being developed. The, the benefits showcase themselves on very, very large um, single parts with a, a very large um, XY build volume. So, do you know what yeah. your build volume is? Like your build volume with this model printer? It's kind of a bit strange to calculate because of the instructions that are there, but we're estimated to be in around the 400 uh, cubic meters. Mm -hmm. Wow, big. Wow. Yeah. yeah. This Every is, time we calculate it, we get a different number, though. Yeah. This is a this is a a shop that is uh, from one end to the other 40 feet long, and we can print the entire length of that. We can fill up. I mean, a couple. A couple days ago, this shop was absolutely full of prints. So, actually, if you want, you can have a quick look at the um, stuff on the truck there. So, we have a, a mini house that we printed over the last couple of days, and uh, it's going to be going uh, onto the site, what, next four or five days? Yep. A couple of elements have already actually been deposited, so we can actually walk you over there and have a quick look at it. Yeah. Got it. Guys are cleaning the pump out right now. It's actually why we asked for a little bit of delay to start because uh, they weren't quite done printing. It's kind of fun watching uh, Peter walking backwards. <laughs> so essentially, right now we're in the process of um, printing and moving parts. Yeah, it seems like you guys have a ton going on. Yeah, we have this really unique opportunity with this Kootenai Lake Village project. There is a, a huge stomach for experimentation. So we're getting to do some things. If you want to just show them the lake and the mountains or feet. Yeah, it looks very beautiful up there in Canada. Yeah. So one of the things that we really wanted to do is uh, figure out exactly what kind of problems the uh, consumers of 3D printing equipment go through. We have a very long history in automation, and building a machine itself is pretty, 
pretty basic. There's not a lot that goes into an actual 3D printer in the grand scheme of what automation is out there. But we, you know, we were very fortunate to meet with some people who've actually already used uh, different types of 3D printing equipment for making houses, like um, Edward in uh, Dubai at 3D Vinci. And we realized that if we really want to be uh, beneficial to our clients, we're going to actually have to know what they're going to go into. So we thought that we'd test a few print houses here at this KLV project, and through that opportunity, we'll actually be able to learn whether or not the machinery we make or machinery you enhance will actually be robust enough to work in a construction environment. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been our main motivation for this last 12 months. Yeah, that's really cool, especially that you guys have already started on a house. I mean, there's a big responsibility for companies like yours to ensure that house printed with a robot is going to end up being secure and stable for a long time. And yeah. it's good. It's great that you're not just jumping into massive projects. Um, we jump into a massive project <laughs> if someone calls us up to do it. <laughs> yeah, like, we're ready for massive projects. <laughs> but houses with like a certificate of occupancy? The buildings that we build are all permanent buildings. Wow. And uh, stru structurally engineered, signed off. So um, you can actually see some of the elements are, um, I'll just show you here. We have 3D printed slab formwork. So the formwork for the um, actual slab on grade is printed as well. Wow, that's and the then first from time there. That. First time you've seen that, huh? Yeah. So did you print that um, in the warehouse and then brought it over? Well, we actually have two printers here. So this one was actually printed on our gantry printer. Okay. And, uh, this was moved into place with two guys. Uh, we didn't actually even have to crane it. So. Yeah. Anyway, we figure we'll go and sit somewhere where there's not too much noise. Yeah, great. And uh, try to not do too much walking around here before Pete falls in a hole. That's a nice door, though. It's good to see if we can be working on it. We're in an area where we can really, uh, you know, play in terms of R&D. We get to do everything from design parts, print parts, place parts, um, and in all the different usability cases. So it's, it's an environment that other people don't really necessarily get, uh -huh. and we try to make the most out of that. So right now, where do your priorities lie? It really has to do with the machine development itself. Um, there's a lot of other great machine builders out there who we think we can contribute to their success as well by um, pump improvements, nozzle improvements, broadening the parameters of different materials can be used. These types of um, issues that uh, basically every construction site is going to have comes from them not being able to perhaps source the specialized material that is necessary for the particular uh, printer to work. How far are you from here? Right now, I'm in Austin, Texas. So oh, if nice. you drive south for, I don't know, maybe 18 hours or so. Awesome. Okay. Get to go see the Icon project there? Well, they're still working on it right now. So they want me to wait until um, August. So I haven't seen it yet, but I will soon, yeah. Nice. So you guys have your facility there in, in Canada. How much work yep. do you have in Canada versus the Netherlands? Because you're, um, you're originally from, your company's originally from the Netherlands, right? We have this um, very broad team made up of people from all over Europe. And of course, Jonathan and I were stationed in the Netherlands for a couple of years with another industry. So when we started the company, we were there. Um, however, we are both Canadian and, and the opportunity to come out here and do this project uh, was not anything that was being offered to us anywhere in the world. So we jumped on it. So, yeah, but it's our idea to be a global company. For those of you who mm -hmm. don't know, Ian on the right is the uh, president of 20 Additive Manufacturing and Jonathan on the left is the head of engineering responsible for the robotic printer that you saw earlier. Yeah. Ian, I'll start um, asking you some questions. You started sure. off or um, you're president also of a skate company? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very old story. Um, I started a skateboard company in high school in 1992. And for, I don't know, I guess 15 years, I tried to make a living at that and decided that it was time to maybe join the real commercial world. And I got into automation for um, building uh, wind turbine blades. 
Wow. The, okay. uh, the thing that's kind of cool about the skateboard business, though, is it, it taught me um, CNC technology. Um, Jim's and Lansky, who you might have saw cleaning the robot here as we were walking by, <laughs> uh, he got me into um, CNC technology. And we were one of the first companies to introduce CNC milling uh, of molds for um, pressing skateboards, for laminating skateboards. Okay. Yeah, that makes yeah. that's how it all kind of intertwines. CNC and 3D printing um, share a lot of similarities, I guess. Well, you'd laugh, but those footings that J uh, Jonathan was showing you earlier, those actually came off the same CNC machine that we built for making skateboards like in 1999 or 2000 or something like that. Yeah, so cool. So you've had... Converted into 3D printer. You've been focused on entrepreneurship for a long time. Yeah. And Jonathan, I saw in your LinkedIn profile that one of your first jobs was actually as a ski instructor. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, I'm the, I'm the only skier of this group Wow. Uh, at the moment. Um, so we love to tease them about it. everybody else is snowboarders. So, Oh, well, but yeah, I say, if you're not hitting the slopes in Canada, you're making a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so we're actually really lucky because right uphill from us here is an old clear cut, and uh, we can snowboard there at lunch break. Yeah. Wow, you have a private trail next to your print facility. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We see yeah. why we came back to Canada now. Eh? There's not much snowboarding in the Netherlands. Uh huh. We're going back there probably in spring for a big project, but mm -hmm. um, for the time being, we'll try to get as many lines in as possible here. Yeah. Yeah. And so your printer that you have now, you have the gantry printer and then you have the nine axis printer. Yeah. We also have a six axis robot in Germany. Which did you develop mm -hmm. first? Uh, I guess the six axis would be the first one that was actually printing. Yeah. Um, but as I'd mentioned, the gantry printer used to be a CNC machine for making skateboard molds. So okay. um, it is the oldest machine in the collection. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were, we were doing uh, prints with a six axis robot in, in Germany uh, last year. I saw a video where you were printing in front of a crowd, um, arches and a bunch of other things. Was that with the six axis printer or the nine axis? That, that was with the nine axis, yeah. All right, so how did you, the, the arch, that's pretty incredible that you were able to make concrete completely bridge in open air. So we, we don't get to take a lot of the credit for that. That actually is um, a really amazing material that was developed by the Baumet team out of Austria. And what they're doing is they're injecting an accelerator at the nozzle level. So we integrated some of their technology into our nine axis machine, which allowed us to be able to print that very um, uh, amazing architectural uh, structure. The, the only issue with that stuff is, is it's quite expensive. Uh, it's going to be really great for doing some of the aesthetics and the architectural work, but it's never going to be a material for building an entire house. So we have to sort of merge their technology with some of the other um, basic materials that are on the market and then there's also some i guess higher end 1k materials like the guys at Etel cementi and Ladacrete and a couple of other companies like rack fix from uh, dubai there's a few people out there de developing some easier to work with materials mm -hmm. and then the other aspect of that is that um to create those arches i would like to say that we are we are not worried about taking risks. And so that, that print of those double arches was the first print that we did of those double arches. Wow. There was no test print before. That was it. And it was live streamed to, uh, to Dubai during the Big Five Dubai. Yeah. It, was, um, it was a pretty big cool risk, aspect. but we're pretty cocky. I'm sure we're starting to get the sense. <laughs> we wanted to, kind of to really come out with a bang. Yeah. yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, we, we had uh, some some great designers work on that, and uh, yeah, they did a great job. It's uh, it came out very well. Yeah, it looked like it came out great. There were some other really cool prints there too. You we, had uh, we couldn't have done that without the help of Baumet, though. For sure, that was their team that yeah. worked with us on that. So. Which team? Sorry. The Baumet team. The Baumet team. Baumet. Yeah. So they're mm -hmm. a, a supplier from Austria. Cool. Mm -hmm. So all these companies in the 3D concrete printing space, they each have kind of different focuses, um, whether it be mechanical, like developing the printer, materials, software, um, construction, all those different things. Is your, it seems to me like your expertise is with the mechanical engineering aspects 
and you guys are mostly focused on building the printer. It's definitely our strongest um, strength is, is mechanical and automation design. Mm -hmm. um, but we're really excited to be as unfocused as possible. <laughs> we're trying to get the full gamut of the industry because it's really early adoption at this point. Um, guys like you, after a few months of research, are some of the experts in the industry already. That's how fast um, it's come up. And uh, we think that even if our automation skills are strong, um, our other skills should be built up alongside of it. Mm -hmm. So we are focused on, like we showed you, learning how to build buildings and how to actually work with the materials and get the materials to perform in different ways. So this is important to us as well, too. Even if it's not our core competence, uh, we want to be able to give our clients the type of advice that will help them have successful projects. Yeah. Our, uh, our experience in automation has really been in the area of um, problem solving and solution finding. So um, we would, in the previous companies, essentially ask our clients, what's your biggest problem? How can we fix that? and make things more efficient or uh, less problematic. And so we're pretty much taking the same stance here where we're approaching 3D printing concrete, 3D printing construction, looking at the entire process and saying, what's the, what's the biggest problem? How can we help? And that's the things that we tend to focus on. And so we're doing a lot of very, you know, uh, iterative design and testing and trying to find new ways to, you know, improve Pump performance, improve. breaking stuff. Yeah, We're breaking lots of things. Yeah, yeah fail good. fast. <laughs> so the pump you mentioned is that a proprietary pump, pump that you guys have developed, or we're hoping to. Yeah, the idea is that we'll release proprietary pump in its complete form, mm -hmm. uh, or else we'll have components that can be added to an M Tech or an MAI or some of the other uh, pump manufacturers out there who joined into the three D printing world. Yeah, like I can say we have a really esoteric approach. We don't want to be just our own products, our own materials, our own um, delivery. You know, we kind of want to work with everybody in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even on the materials side, we are, we are working with multiple partners on materials. Uh, we're not in a singular, you know, relationship and um, we, we want to see whatever the best materials are and see if we can use those. Not all the materials work in the best applications exactly. um, in the same way. So. For example, printing a column or printing a, a foundation are completely different things. So our clients should eventually be able to have machines that they can run expensive materials to for, for highly ornate items and uh, lower cost material for something that's just eventually going to get backfilled with uh, soil or rocks or something anyways. It's not even going to be visible. So you know, we want to try to um, get the industry to mature to that level. Mm -hmm. So you're experimenting with different types of concrete and figuring out what works best where? Precisely. Exactly. Great. So it, have you guys been working together in projects before 20 additive manufacturing? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think Jonathan's first job was a company that uh, I was working at. Yep. Uh, first job outside of engineering school anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Straight out of engineering school, I uh, uh, worked with Ian at uh, PH Wind Solutions. And so uh, I was working as a mechanical designer and mechanical engineer there designing automation equipment for them and uh, was there for many years. So I actually hired you before you graduated, didn't we? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We went and snapped them up before we <laughs> on the job market. How long ago was that? I was 2014. Sounds about right. Yeah. So you guys have back there. experience working together <laughs> and you've been working with 20 additive manufacturing for how long? Well, we're, we're part of the founding team. So there's five of us founding owners in the company. And we basically got together in December of 2017. 18. Well, January of 2018. No. Nope. Oh, so, no. okay. December of so 2018. Yeah, yeah. Yes, December of 2018. <laughs> and said that we're going to start this company. In only two years or a year and a half, really, you've made all this progress? Yep. We're yeah. pretty proud of it, actually. That's incredibly fast. It's mostly a pile of broken parts, though. You have to understand that we're wrecking lots of things along the way. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're perfectly okay with a broken part as long as we learn something from it. I have a little experience with 3D printing, not with concrete, but with like a little plastic printer. And half the time, my prints don't come out right, and I have to take them off the print bed and throw them away. But when it's a tiny plastic piece, it's so easy to just pick it up and trash it. If it's a big concrete print, uh, what do you guys use? A sledgehammer? Well, uh, fortunately, we have uh, a lot of need for aggregate anyways. 
So okay. this stuff gets crumbled back up. Um, yeah, it yeah. actually falls apart fairly easy, this stuff, you know. But we have uh, excavator, we have loader, we have big machines for wrecking things here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's funny you bring that up, though, because we had this um, really cool conversation with a, a team from the University of Innsbruck. And they really have also revolutionized some of the tool path generation that exists um, in, in the grasshopper add-ins that a lot of people are using for Rhino. And they told us when they quote their jobs, their 3D printing jobs with concrete, they actually count the material at double what the actual mass of the material is going to be because they expect to fail one out of every two prints. And that's not a very far off statistic across the board when it comes to 3D printing for concrete right now. No, that's horrible. That shouldn't be that way. And a lot of our motivation right now is to try to make it so the first prints are great prints. Yeah. I guess a lot of the problem with that is not even the printer, but it couldn't be the design and the 3D model that you're printing off of. Yeah, it's infinite variables. For sure, design is a huge part of it, but so can a clogged pump, so can a clogged hose, Much a can. nozzle that's been um, caked up a little bit on the end. There's so many variables in 3D printing that can cause problems. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of these uh, prints are essentially supposed to be exposed beads, right? So you're looking at the bead, which means every single defect is visible, right? So as I think, I expect as it becomes more mainstream, people are gonna be just happy to just, you know, uh, rework and and finish the the concrete and accept lower quality. But right now, the bead is the product. And so every little hiccup with the pump, with the the robotics, anything is, is visible, you know? Um, we have some layer heights on beads that are seven and a half millimeters a layer. So um, the the tolerances we're keeping to and the, the bead dimensions we're keeping to are very strict um, on the quality of the bead, but then also on the on the geometry side, like Ian was talking about, there's a lot that goes into the geometry to avoid collapse in using materials that uh, take time to set, right? Mm-hmm. It's very easy, I, won't, I don't want to say that. It's uh, more easy to uh, have a successful non-collapsing print or non-buckling print when you have very long uh, bead lengths. But whenever you build a small section and your build rate is fast, then you're fighting that, that knife edge of uh, slenderness ratio that can cause your part to collapse. And so we're, we're getting closer and closer to that, that line, but you have to, Make sure you stay on the right side of it. Otherwise, you use sledgehammers and uh, power tools. Seven and a half millimeters per layer? Yes, in some cases. On our, on our uh, fine beads, yes. Wow, that's extremely small for concrete. Yeah, that's a layer height of seven and a half and a bead width of 22 and a half millimeters. So what's the maximum layer height that you print with? Um, I don't think we've done much more than 20 millimeters tall. Right, right now it's 20. Yeah. yeah. 20 millimeters tall and 50 or 60 wide. Yeah. And we have the capability to do more than that. We just don't like the finish. Uh, yeah. We do actually want people to fall in love with this look. You know, it's not uh, fun when people come to us and ask, well, are you going to finish it or plaster it or something like that? Um, you know, we obviously we don't want to be the wood paneling in everyone's basement from the 1970s, <laughs> but we would like it if perhaps people would adopt this as kind of being a new trendy look for things that they're having in their um, whatever architectural design or interior design or you know, their their objectives would try to include some 3D printed elements because it, it looks cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of people like argue about that whether to have the layers or the, <laughs> like plaster over them or something. I think that it's better just to leave it how it is naturally because that demonstrates the technology that's being used. I mean, what's the point of showing someone a 3D printed house if it's just going to look like a regular concrete house? Like, they're not going to. You actually bring up a really valid point, uh, Jared. There's a lot of people who will look at this type of new technology and they want to figure out how it is they can replace something they're already doing in their current construction strategies. And the reality is, is when a new technology like this comes along, it should be embraced for everything it can offer. It shouldn't be there to replace something that maybe already works. Um, Because if you're doing that, then the first conversation is always going to be about cost and time. And 
you know, those are important things, but that's not really exciting either. You know, it's almost a race to the bottom as soon as you decide that everything is going to be about cost reduction. Mm -hmm. When we set out here on this KLV project, we actually wanted to build a really beautiful, very expensive home, uh, in which case 3D printing would be showcased at its absolute most. So yeah. the uh, freeform design, the non-rectilinear development of, of all the architectural elements in the, in the building was going to be the thing that made this house look amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to take into consideration that COVID is having a bit of an effect on the way the world is looking at uh, sort of um, exorbitant or luxurious uh, purchases at this moment in time. So we decided in parallel to jump into a low cost, low cost house as well. Too. Mm -hmm. And on, on that topic of kind of um, using 3D printing for what it's good for, there are benefits to 3D printing, right? And you should use those where they are beneficial. But where they're not beneficial, you shouldn't use it. And so these stairs are actually a perfect example of that. Um, this, the 3D printing was used to create the, the bullnose and the, the face of the stairs. But there's no extra benefit to 3D printing the uh, lower section that's structural, wow. right? You don't need 3D printing for a straight bead. And so what we actually did with these stairs is we 3D printed the, the I don't know, the, the steps but then we flipped it and did a conventional cast core um, for the lower structural section. And so you have the combination of complexity and a slightly higher material cost for the stairs and the structural section is cheaper and conventional, essentially. Yeah, that seems practical. To me, it's yeah. like leaving the, leaving the layers as the exterior is almost like how the, the cyber truck is like the exterior is the structural support and it's like the visual part. Um, whereas most cars have like the, the inside and the metal like framework and the chassis and then an the exterior like panels that are just for looks. So it's yeah. much cooler for me from an engineering perspective and from uh, even like a cost perspective, it's better to just leave it how it is and rather than demonstrating like the flatness. Um, yeah, it's really cool that you were trying to demonstrate like the the luxury opportunity for 3D printed construction. It sounds like using parametric architecture and a lot of freeform design. Um, but it, it totally makes sense that in the current like economic, socioeconomic landscape, uh, that's not really where the focus is right now. We still have intention of doing something along those lines, but the... Uh... I guess the, the attention that we want to get for our efforts right now has to be in the same vein of contributing to what everybody in society is going through right now. And we're definitely going to see an economic depression that's going to last for a while through this. Um, even if it's not all sectors of all industries, for sure there's going to be struggle because of this COVID. Yeah. And uh, we've got some great connections uh, with people in, in housing, Ministry of Housing, people working for um, Aboriginal Affairs to try to develop housing in some of the more remote communities in Canada. And we think that attacking a low-cost house through 3D printing techniques is something that is almost our moral obligation mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. And um, to, to finish that off, the, the low-cost housing is not just in the upfront ticket price, but in the running cost of a house, mm -hmm. right? The sustainability long-term of a house. And what you get when you get to 3D print an inner and outer bead to a wall cavity is that you get practically free in terms of the concrete increase in wall cavity right so if you want to increase your r value for your wall and you want to make your wall thicker you're not switching from a two by four to a two by six to a two by eight to a two by ten you're just placing the beads further apart right in areas where we need good thermal performance that has an amazing return where you can make a wall that is you know r60 and passive house level and it's not going to cost much more than a building code passing, uh, you know, uh, here would be called step one or step two uh, house in terms of the concrete. Obviously, there's more insulation, so there's more cost on the insulation. But in terms of the structural, um, it's a very limited increase in cost. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because the interior wall and the exterior wall are the same length anyway. It's just the tiny connection. Exactly. 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 So, so one of the things we've actually been focusing on the last year is trying to come up with different thermal bridging techniques. 
Um, by that, we are talking about the ways that the two walls are connected to each other. So they maintain some sort of structural rigidity when we're moving them. Um, and this is an area where the bowment material was very cool to work with because it's very fast curing. You can do overhangs. And so we could make these bridges between the inside wall and the outside wall. It would make it so the two walls are attached. However, the surface area that was actually connecting the two parts gets down to like one or one and a half percent of the overall surface area of the actual exterior wall. You don't need to go all the way from the ground in this connected no, part. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You'll see, you know, in the, the I hate to use the term conventional 3D printing, but um, <laughs> in the conventional 3D printing, um, it's, con it's a zigzag, but it's continuous mm -hmm. all the way through. And so you have a lot of thermal bridging going on. And that's a, a very large cross-sectional area of concrete going through low your, your wall. Yeah, very low R value. And so you'll see on some of our, uh, I, I think it was posted on Instagram or somewhere, some of the uh, examples of our connectors. And we, you know, we've tried arches, diamonds, circles, all sorts of things, different ways of bridging. And we have a wall cavity that essentially goes 400 millimeters wide and is only connecting with, you know, one or 1.5% 1 of the uh, uh, cross-sectional area of the wall. Wow, that's very interesting. So which, which wall uh, method for the interior structure did you use for the house that's, that we just saw? Uh, rebar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, the, uh, because we wanted to go with the 1K material for this, to try to keep the cost low, yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't do the bridging the way we wanted to, so we just uh, hand-placed the rebar, mm -hmm. just little six-inch cuts of rebar in between the walls. Yeah. And that allows us to prevent the uh, thermal bridging. And in terms of printing, it's just two completely separate elements. So you have an in interior wall and exterior wall that are printed at the same time, and they're connected at the ends of the the part. But those uh, ends of the parts are actually going to be cut away, and so the final house is going to have two continuous walls: one interior wall, one exterior wall, and they will not actually be connected with anything other than uh, some rebar that is holding them uh, at the correct distance apart. And then we're gonna be using um, some foam for uh, the insulation. So yeah, the house that you just showed me, what's the next step for that? Are all the walls done? You're gonna put glass doors or is there still more walls to go up? Well, all the walls are pretty much printed. Uh -huh. um, there's a secondary section we have to put for the higher part of the building, like the it's not second, quite a second story. floor, but there's a, yeah. a mezzanine. Okay. And uh, they're pretty much going to be all in place by next week. Essentially, we, we did it in uh, two, two, two large height jumps. So the first one essentially accomplishes the first level. So it's uh, over two meters tall. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is going from that horizontal surface. And it's the print you actually saw that it has an angle to it. And that angle is what differentiates the, the roof slope. So the roof is actually going to be at that slope. That's good. So what's In a the... way, there's an arc though. So It's a slope on an arc. It's actually a very confusing print to look at because <laughs> it looks like the print is getting smaller, getting further away. It also, with an arc, looks like every wall is about to fall over because mm -hmm. uh, of the optical illusion of that. But Again, for our first house print, we decided to make it with no square walls. <laughs> smart, eh? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think that is smart because it demonstrates kind of the differences even though you're going for an affordable house kind of look, yeah. it's not a boxy traditional look and it's still something that's going to, I don't know, maybe excite people a bit. So yeah. I'm wondering though, you mentioned the roof. How are you going to build the roof? What are you going to make the roof out of? We're going to use conventional roofing uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. So it'll be uh, timber uh, trusses and uh, I think we'll have either a torch down bitumen or an asphalt. Yeah. And that's all tied into, um, essentially um, concrete columns that are part of the walls. So the walls have specifically located, printed in circular column um, gaps or openings. Mm -hmm. And in there we're putting rebar and doing a conventional pour and using that to support the roof. This, this is not us alone, eh? This is everybody across the globe is doing this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this unfortunate um, situation we find ourselves in in time because there are no real jurisdictional uh, regulations to 3D printing yet. So in, out, in order for us to get our building permit and for uh, COBOD to get their building permit and for um, 3D Vinci to get their building permit, they have to take into consideration old calculating methods for structural integrity. 
And in this case, we make a, a column. And so we'll actually be doing all the civil on a post and beam strategy. It doesn't even take into consideration the structural elements we get out of the printed wall. Mm -hmm. And it's sad because obviously we'd love to get the uh, structural integrity of the printed wall itself in the uh, calculations, but uh, this thing will be pretty bomb proof. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But it's the local municipality that determines. Um... It's just about everybody, Jared. Nobody really knows what 3D printing is. So they kind of let it uh, through if you would consider it as if it was a cinder block. So even though our cinder blocks are two meters long and two meters tall, it still falls under the same category as a cinder block when the engineers are doing their uh, load calculations. Mm -hmm. But a cinder block would, they would allow that to have structural integrity and support the building. With pores in correct locations. And so that's where it's similar in that, um, with a cinder block wall, you're going to have to have every four feet or eight feet, depending on you know regulation, you're going to put a piece of rebar down and you're going to pour it. And that's going to be a solid pour that's spaced out along the wall. Ours is the same in that we have the, the wall, majority of the wall is just doing a facade job. It's, it's just you know closing the wall. And then at certain locations, you have columns that are poured. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, especially because when you're pouring the columns, the framework for that is already built, which is fantastic. So it's less left in place formwork. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very gorgeous product. It's just an unnecessary, it's an overbuilt. Uh -huh. We're building to appease to uh, regulations, not to uh, mm -hmm. actual calculations. And there, there are um, discussions out there by standard bodies uh, for acceptance of 3d printed elements directly, meaning the 3d printed element itself will be structural and you don't need a conventional pour on top of that. The issue right now with that is that, um, you need one test specimen per part, which means if you want to build a house and have it pass structurally, you have to build two houses and break one. In some jurisdictions, <laughs> that's not everywhere. Right. And so that, that, and that it's, it's that that is on a per design basis. Right. And so down the road, I, I see a, a time when we can have things pass by simulation and by, um, you know, FEA directly and then not require that, that uh, physical testing. Um, um, but as it stands right now, every time you change the design, you need more physical testing, right? So if you print, you're saying you need to print two houses, break one to test the strength of it. Can you, after you test it, can you print a hundred of that same house? One yes. Yeah. Yes. So this if you're building our, a development. This is our domain. This, yeah. this is the domain of the um, regulators. Yeah. Or if it's each part, like the house that you're building now has like three parts, what if you reuse that one part in different ways in a modular design? That's a great yes. question. One yes. would think, think you'd be able to. Yep. Assuming similar loadings, right? <laughs> cool. And so that's, yeah. you're saying like everywhere, um, but in Canada, is that one of the places they're demanding you print to or? Well, we're, okay. So what he's saying is like, if you want to start using the structural integrity of the, the print. printed elements yeah. Yeah. as it truly is. If we want to bypass its classification as a cinder block, mm -hmm. as opposed to which like, in our case, we don't have time for that. We don't want to wait for people to um, go through the approving process. We'll yeah. just follow their rules for now and we'll lobby for the standards and, and uh, the uh, universities are doing their uh, research and development and getting this stuff accepted more um, across the board. Um, we kind of feel it's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's good. You guys are trudging forward regardless. Mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. Make sure you follow the laws and then help the laws catch up to what you want to do down the road. I don't know who said it. Um, someone, maybe it was Steve Jobs or something, but if you're like innovating at a certain pace, the law can't catch up to you. <laughs> and so it's like kind of... That's true. And um, as we work with structural engineers that have not seen this you know, before, there's going to be more and more common knowledge being adopted by the, the structural engineering firms and the people that uh, create house designs for building code compliance. They're going to get more and more comfortable with it. And even just the standards as they are now are going to become easier and easier to implement with a 3D printed house, right? Because people will have seen a similar project before. The first project is always going to get the most scrutiny. And then after that, it's going to you know, start easing up. Are there any other companies operating in Canada doing 3D printing of concrete? 
Um, there was a company out of Vancouver. I'm drawing a blank what their name is. Carpa. Um, Carpa, right, exactly. Um, I'm not sure how far along they are with their projects. Um, but of course, there's the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec, who has a very strong interest out of their actually rheology department. Yep. Um, we just spoke yesterday with somebody from the University of Saskatchewan who's looking to get 3D printing up into the north. So the Northwest Territories, Yukon, Nunavut, uh, these are parts of Canada that have really um, bad housing issues. Yeah. Uh, so they're hoping to perhaps introduce this technology up there. Um, I've heard yeah, another, another company from Vancouver called, well, Salt Spring Island called Strong Print 3D. They haven't printed their first project yet, but they've uh, asked us to get involved with them to help get that going as well. So we're excited about that. I met some guy through LinkedIn from Quebec who was telling me about how in none of it, there's a huge need for um, for housing and the traditional housing that they provide to the people, like indigenous people there, they hate it because it's like, it's stick built and they'll even take apart the houses to burn it for wood in the winter. Um, mm -hmm. And I was describing to me that there's a huge need for uh, like strong houses that can last through the winter in the North. Yeah. And there aren't nearly enough people to go build them because it's so remote that, yeah. uh, I can actually uh, connect you, uh, Jared, with somebody who would be a, a wonderful person to interview on this subject. Uh, it's a guy, uh, Ken Coates, this guy we were talking to yesterday. He's dedicated his life to this, and um, he definitely could uh, perhaps give you more insight on that than we can. I really don't want to, um, what's the word I want to say, um, state uh, hyperbole. I'd much rather you get from the direct source you know, what the situation is. But um, it's embarrassing, to say the least, um, how the Canadian people and the Canadian government have treated their uh, Aboriginal uh, communities of the north. Mm -hmm. Another interesting point he brought up, and I don't really know anything about uh, the people in none of it, but he said that historically they lived in igloos and circle-shaped houses, and like dome-shaped houses. Mm -hmm. So the guy I was talking to was describing mm -hmm. yeah. you could build almost a concrete igloo that would be much more... Um, suitable for their culture, yeah. their traditional culture. We, we we would actually be breaking non-disclosure agreement if we carried on with this conversation anymore at this point. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just say you're not the first person to come up with that concept. Yeah, cool. All right. So after you print this house that you guys showed me, what's the next project you'll be working on, or is that also uh, under an NDA? No, no. I mean, we we have this uh, goal to um, build a big printer in the Netherlands. It's uh, hoping to be the biggest printer ever made. Cool. Uh, whether or not we have a client for it yet is still up in the air. <laughs> a few people kicking the tires on this one. But um, our goal is to really attack uh, the problem that we think everyone's facing, and that is that you don't have a broad range of materials that can work in a printer. So if you want to be uh, printing um, high-end materials and low, lower cost materials out of the same printer, you want to be able to swap out of them quickly, you want to be able to clean up quickly, you want to have good cross adhesion or mechanical um, interlocking of these uh, uh, different materials. And none of this has really been addressed by the industry yet. So we're hoping to really focus on that over the next uh, year and a half, two years. How big do you want to make the printer you're saying? Uh, what did we say that one was going to be? I think the exact numbers have to stay uh, yeah. under wraps. Um, so you know that, you know that the biggest printer that's out there right now? bigger than that one. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I say it's like 100 feet by 160 feet or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Wh whatever that is in meters. <laughs> um, yeah, and so it's, it's really a, a printer that could be used on site or in a production environment. So, um, because there's a reality that there are production houses out there that have a, a physical, you know, successes printer sitting there and producing uh, small parts, landscaping elements, and whatnot, and then you have on-site printers. And there's no reason that uh, one solution or a couple configurations of one solution can't be adaptable to both cases, right? Well, that's very interesting. Most companies I talk to either say you need to print on-site or you need to print off-site. <laughs> you guys are ready. To we do. They also say you should only do single component or only do uh, dual component with accelerators. You know. We're, we're material agnostic and we're, you know, we machine agnostic, machine agnostic. We, we care about having solutions. So 
there are cases where a uh, single component, uh, you know, a slow curing, slow setting for a large build site, that's the correct case. And a large printer uh, with relatively cheap components on it, you know, mostly Cartesian. And then there's cases where you want all those different axes and you can orient your nozzle in different directions. Like you saw the print going there. That's a off-plane print with a single component material. <laughs> So no, um, no accelerant. With no additional accelerant. Yeah. Seems like you guys are very versatile. You print in different materials. You got the gantry printer. You got the robotic arm printer in six axis or nine axis. Print on site, off site. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such a big space, such a big industry. Like, there's so many different um, skills to encompass. Have you, I mean, I guess it's, you've told me many times you're still staying adaptable and you haven't picked anything to be like your primary focus or revenue stream yet. Um, what's your, what do you think it's going to look like three years or five years down the line? Or are you just opening a lot of doors and waiting to see what gets the most feedback and just going to take whatever route makes the most sense? Well, it's really hard to predict the future, of course, yeah. whenever you deal with a brand new technology. And so that is probably one of the main reasons why we're keeping as many doors open as possible. Um, our core competences are also developing over the years of uh, R&D we're doing here. We might feel that we've actually achieved something that is really far ahead of everybody else in the industry. And we can either do really well with it, or we know that nobody else in the industry is really going to jump on it because they won't have had the time or the energy or perhaps even just the luck to come across with a, a machine or the technique for doing something. Um, I think that a guy with a 3D printer who's just making st staircases can be a multi-million dollar business. Yeah. You know, there's so many avenues where this technology can be used. And the thing that we're hoping to do is actually help people find their avenues, if that makes any sense. So somebody will come to us who knows everything there is to know about making staircases, except for how to make care of them with a 3d printer so we'll just address the 3d printing element of what it is they're trying to accomplish and be that for them mm -hmm. if that makes any sense yeah that makes and sense. the the you know 3d printing using concrete and you know geopolymers and, and whatnot is pretty much at the state right now that you know plastic small scale 3d printing was uh, a while ago in that the population the general population doesn't really comprehend or grasp um, how it works, what its limitations are. And so part of our job is actually education and educating the public and potential customers from different industries as to what 3D printing with concrete is, right? Because when you talk to someone outside of this small, tight group of you know, um, companies, 3D printing companies, um, there's a, a knowledge gap there, a, a learning curve that needs to take place. And the construction industry is gigantic. The 3D printing section of that is tiny, you know, relatively speaking. And so um, if the construction industry learns about how and what 3D printing with concrete is, then that marketplace grows, right? Yeah, it really does seem to me like so much of the technology is already there. And it's just a matter of time until people become more comfortable with it. Um, at this point, you guys have a pretty capable printer and you printed a lot of stuff. And so how, how are you going to demonstrate to people that it's like the best solution? Well, again, it's not asking them to replace something they're already doing. Sure. Uh, we think that the clients that we have that are going to have the most success um, are going to look at 3D printing at um, adding to what they're already offering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So doing something better uh, in a way that the conventional methods don't even support. Yeah. And say your customers, are most of your customers people who want you to print stuff for them or they want to buy your printer? It's a pretty good mix. There's, there's an aspect of it where they, people just need to have a 3D printed element that they can see and touch and and understand what it looks like and how it how it uh, you know behaves, and from there, 
they want to implement that into whatever their production is. So for example, someone that wants to make stairs. Um, and also getting the point across to people, the level of, um, how would you say, using parametric software to generate um, tool paths and generate parts, it opens people's possibilities to create stuff by a lot. For example, these stairs here are based on a single program. And if someone wants an extra stair, they change one number and you get a new print code, right? Um, so when someone understands that, they can, instead of having form work for cat precast stairs of all these different shapes and they have a yard full of um, form work for precast stairs, suddenly they can get rid of the majority of their form work and have a single program to uh, generate their different uh, stair designs, right? Yeah, as you're so, saying, it's, it's making me realize how difficult it's going to be to do like a comparison <laughs> for people. I mean, for them to like have to store all those frameworks and not have a custom framework. I mean, there's so many different efficiencies that are generated from using a printer and then printing in concrete without excessive formworks. But I mean, like I said earlier, like how do you prove that to people? Like how do you put a dollar value on all of that added efficiency? Right. The, the efficiency area is such a tricky um, and tight um, gain to show right now with such a new technology that it's not the area that's worth the most focus in my opinion. Yeah. It's like Ian says, showcasing the abilities, the, the stuff on top, because if you're trying to compare um, existing to new directly right now, um, there's areas that are, uh, the, the costs are, are increased um, on materials, on, on machinery. Um, and you, you can't get those efficiency numbers without a lot of historical data on, on production and seeing those test cases. So essentially we have to hit those test cases and use the printers in a lot of different avenues, but not in an attempt right away to get the efficiency more to learn how they act in those new environments. That's that a great sense. Point. I always like to try to think about things that I can control rather than things that I can't control. And like you're saying, to demonstrate the efficiency is so complex. Um, it, yeah, it's definitely smart that you're showcasing the technologies and stuff like that right now. And I think that with time uh, and scale of the industry, as more people realize it's efficient, the, if the, or more people realize its potential rather, the efficiency yeah. will come with scale. Exactly. And as people uh, in the industry see uh, potential um, orders and demand, then you'll start seeing prices drop because everyone is um, pricing things based on the state of the art as they are now, right? And suddenly when the, the market is growing and demand is increasing, you'll, you'll start to see people having the ability to reduce costs and get those efficiency gains. Yeah. There is an enormous amount of work that needs to be done by the material suppliers as yeah. well too. I mean, we're very lucky that we're working with the companies we are because they have created a, a great product. But even the most um, cost-effective material working with here is something like four times the cost of conventional concrete from your standard local ready mix supplier. Mm -hmm. So um, this is an area that's got to come down a lot. Um, one of the things, of course, we can demonstrate with using high cost materials is reducing the overall cost of the construction by doing things like uh, 400 millimeter walls instead of 300 millimeter walls or um, making abstract columns that would be very difficult to do with um, the conventional form work. But at some point, the really big buyers are the ones who are buying to build 10,000 houses or 15,000 houses at a time, not the the mom and pop or the the new family who wants to make something cool with their life savings you know yeah it's uh always going to be a cost factor at the end and right now the materials for the 3d printing industry are still too expensive mm -hmm. is there something like a specific component that makes them so expensive i think it has to do with the ratios and getting the formula right there's a real science behind making this material perform the way we want it to perform as it comes through and also mm -hmm. Um, if you were able to have a machine that could do on, on the fly um, 
adjustments to the material qualities through machine learning or just a better sensor array, then perhaps we can start using a little less um, scientifically, um, I wouldn't say developed, but say the, the, the tolerance range or the variance, variable range that uh, the material suppliers are being held to could have a little bit more fluctuation to it. Yeah, uh, because the machine itself would be offsetting the inconsistencies that we would see in those bags as they come off the truck. It's um, it's a it's a game of of people designing two different variables, and right now there's certain aspects of the 3D printer, for example, pumps that are kind of set, and people tend to use certain you know M techs and MAI pumps, and therefore material suppliers see that pump and they try and design a recipe that works with that pump. And then you have a single recipe that works with a single pump, which is, that's not very flexible. Um, yeah. And uh, they put a lot of effort into getting that recipe right. And there's a lot of um, essentially um, extra effort put in to make a material work with a selection of a pump. Rather than having those things mutually iterate and work together, you're just trying to jam it through an existing product. And so you, that, that can contribute to, you know, a lot of additives to try and make the material more workable, flowable, um, and then still come out the nozzle and z have zero slump. Materials is definitely one of the areas in like this space that kind of needs a lot of work, seems like. If they do need a lot of work, if we're not going to work on the rest of the equipment in the chain. There you go. <laughs> what we're hoping to do, what our core competence is going to be um, dedicated to, we think, is um, making it so that the material suppliers can get their costs down because they don't need to have such uh, highly developed formulas, that their formulas can uh, fluctuate a little bit in what they're providing. Especially if the uh, structural engineers aren't even taking into consideration the strength of the walls that you're printing, um, it mm -hmm. seems like they could definitely, I don't want to say cut corners, but they could reduce the structural strength of the of the wall if it's really just there to like stop the wind more or less yeah i i don't know if that's really an issue right now i think workability is everything it's how the it's how that material is when it's in the dry auger how that material is when it first comes into contact with the water how it's going through the hose what happens at the deposition nozzle all of these areas um can cause uh, you know weird turbulence in the, in the in the liquid so that you start getting build up in different areas you've got the exothermal reaction that causes um perhaps uh, over curing in parts of the, of the, the line you don't want uh, it's a it's a really complicated process uh, and Actually, it's a very complicated process and it's also coming from the fact that the material suppliers need to be able to stand behind their products and so they cannot supply something that is super pumpable and can 3D print something and then is not strong, right? Um, therefore, they, they put in whatever's required to make sure that it still can meet um, all the you know, ASTM standards and, and specs uh, for uh, that given product, whether it's mortar or uh, uh, whatever it is. They, they still need to meet those specs internally. They, they really need to do that and therefore, when you match the structural strength afterwards and the, the pump ability and printability, those two things um, collide because the, the line of what's suitable is just, you know, they're, they're just set and not, not really relevant to what is actually required. They're set by existing standards. So an existing standard for uh, the way a concrete needs to be and an existing standard for, for a pump design, for example. It seems like Jonathan agrees with you, actually. <laughs> so the structural integrity does need to be taken into consideration. <laughs> they 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 go over and above the the standards, right? Yeah. Uh, because because they want to make sure they're absolutely safe. Obviously, I'm not saying we should not follow the standards, but um, they're being extra conservative. From a permitting standpoint and structural engineering standpoint, it's almost like they're trying to fit a circle into a square uh, or something like that. Like it's not the problem. Well, they're 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 specking the concrete that is currently not passing as structure. They're specking it as structure. Does that make sense? Yeah, that sounds very frustrating. <laughs> but it's it's just the the reality of the way the standards are, right? Uh, you can't have a material supplier supply something that doesn't meet any specs. So. <laughs>
how long do you think it will be until you go after that luxury house project you were talking about? Uh, we're hoping to have it done sometime this year before the frost comes. Oh, wow. That's soon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hoping. There's a few hoops we've got to jump through first. How much land are you guys working on up there? The, the property size, it's available to us. Not really clear, to be honest. Um, it's a very large uh, site. It's uh, a little bit remote. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, several acres anyways. Yeah, cool. Uh, I'm not sure if we'd be allowed to completely cover the place with 3D printing, but we will if they let us. <laughs> Little showcase village. Do you get any kind of um, support from Canada or the Netherlands for your business? Um, till date, we've been 100% self-financed. Actually, it's something we're quite proud of. We um, do recognize that there is some advantage to perhaps getting government grants for some of the specific research and development things we might want to accomplish. Um, but at the same time, you know, when you chase grants, you sometimes get yourself off course, and you're now um, I guess redirecting your company so that it appeases to some sort of approving body. And uh, I don't know, we're, we're doing okay right now on our own. So we've kind of avoided the grant writing to an extent, but uh, I can see a couple of the projects we're looking at now perhaps being uh, beneficially helped from some of the different programs that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, Canada is a little bit less aggressive in helping technology. Uh, the Netherlands, well, the uh, European Union as a whole, has some phenomenal grants out there. So uh, it is quite conceivable that we'll be looking to uh, do some cool stuff with some of those um, science bodies over there. Mm -hmm. It's great that you're self-financed, though. That gives you a lot of freedom uh, and, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously control over whatever you guys want to do. Nobody can tell you to focus on one thing versus another. Yeah, I, I think it's because um, how much stuff we break. <laughs> we we wouldn't want to have to answer to um, investors who are not actually engaged on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't understand. Well, they might understand, but they might just bring it to a stop. <laughs> <laughs> Behind you, is that the warehouse or is that a separate greenhouse? That's a that's called the glass house. It's where we actually have our board meetings and lunch. So it's not a greenhouse, mm -hmm. it's just a glass house. <laughs> it is well, it is a greenhouse, but it's got maybe ten plants in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So you have it's your just our space. We just use it as office space. That's a beautiful office space. Thanks. So when are you coming up to visit us in person? <laughs> um, you know, how does uh how does July sound? Oh, July'd be great. Yeah. Maybe the, maybe there'll be a house sitting over there. You'll be able to stand. Wow, you guys serious? We're hoping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll definitely stay in touch. I uh. I drove from New York to Austin, so it's, cool. I would totally be willing to drive from Austin to <laughs> Canada. That's great. Yeah, so I, I, I drove out here. There, I guess, eh? What's that? You're going to stick around in Austin for a while? Yeah, I mean, I have to be back here in August to do the, to do the icon thing. Um, right. In late August, I'll, I'm going to the Middle East, so that should be pretty cool. <laughs> Nice. Well, we're really impressed with all the research and the work you're doing and, and trying to gather all the heads together, Jared. It's uh, uh, awesome. Especially your, your, uh, your sleuth work, trying to uh, find the house. The work you're driving around. <laughs> more impressive. Uh, we did the same thing. The first time we went to Dubai, we were hunting for a house and we had somebody um, back in Europe on Google Earth <laughs> trying to find it for us and <laughs> Nice. Text us the locations uh, while we're riding the taxi. Yeah. And then the taxi kicked us out. <laughs> we had to start walking. I guess they don't want to give but, you guys tours as much because you're like the competition. No, in this case, it was a building just hadn't been open to the public yet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, things can be a little bit, um, people keep their cards close to their chest in Dubai. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Especially with such a cutting edge industry. I mean, people keep their cards close to their chest in general. It's, People are putting a lot of time and effort into innovating and they don't want their innovations to be stolen from other companies, which is totally understandable. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. But at the same time, we, we wouldn't be where we were if we didn't have the help from people like Volker or um, even just talking with people like Henrik at Cobot or, or Barry at CB. All of these uh, people were very open with us to tell us strengths and the weaknesses of, of what's going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. And of course, 3D printing as a whole wouldn't be where it is without open source concepts. Mm -hmm. So. 
again, yeah. you know, it's another moral obligation. We feel that uh, we might develop something that is a unique idea that could be patented and could be a very financially um, beneficial uh, development for the company. But at the same time, there's a lot of things we're doing that other people are going to come up with if it's not us within a few weeks or a few months or a few years anyway. And we'd rather just release that out there so that the whole industry can come up together. Really, our, our competition is not other 3D printers. Our competition is all the construction companies are going to avoid uh, introducing this technology to the construction sites. Nice. That's big ambition. The construction industry is the best industry in the world. Yeah. It's also, it's also the client. Do you guys have experience with construction or is that something that you're kind of learning on the, on the go? Some of us don't, but uh, some of us do. Uh, in timber frame construction, in um, like conventional housing. Um, Jim Zimlanski has experienced yeah. uh, working with uh, CNC mills uh, for large timber assemblies. So, you know, the uh, CLTs and um, different beams. There's a, a company that he, he has experience with here that uh, produces some gorgeous pieces of wood. And there's no reason why, in the, same, in the same vein as there's no reason that you have to only do 1K or 2K material, or you have to only do a six axis robot or a gantry. There's also no reason why uh, the house has to be entirely concrete, right? We're in Canada, there's a lot of wood here, and um, there's a lot of experience and technology around um, timber. And so if you have a house that has structural elements that are concrete and different elements that are wood, that's a, a wonderful pairing together because they have their different strengths, right? You should actually look up the, the Tim, the company that Jim was working for. It's called Spearhead Timberworks. These, these guys have done some gorgeous projects and they're not far from us here, uh, about um, three or four miles away. Mm -hmm. And they have done like uh, ski lodges for Aspen. I think they built a house for Oprah Winfrey. Um, it's, a, it's another example of a small town business based here that is uh, taking digital manufacturing to the whole world. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. I think that's a great idea to use 3D printed construction in conjunction with natural wood or glass, whatever other materials you're going to get involved. Um, yeah, why build it all out of one material? Even most houses today have different... Con different uh, that doesn't mean you're cutting out the uh, automated uh, type of construction because these are all CNC operated mills. Um, and so you can have your, your model, your, your CAD model ready of your house that includes your concrete elements, your wood elements, and everything goes to the machines and runs. It's tricky, I guess, to implement the timber into the parametric design, right? Not at all. Nope. Not at all. <laughs> these, these houses these guys are doing are 100% parametrically designed. So the, the built information model, or the BIM, as everybody uh, refers to it, it's becoming the buzzword right across the construction world. Uh, everywhere you go now, people are talking about BIM. Uh, predominantly Revit, I guess, the Autodesk-based software is the one that's really uh, leading the charge. And it's given the ability for engineers and architects and construction um, contractors to really uh, communicate all the information that goes into a build across, uh, you know, from the design phase right up till the, the turn of the key. And um, we want to collaborate with any other type of digital manufacturing companies out there who recognize how the BIM is going to be um, driving their production uh, practices. There's also any type of information that can be baked back into other geometry because of um, adding empirical numbers into the BIM once um, you've started to um, uh, start the construction. So for example, it's quite notorious that the people doing the foundation gobble up the majority of the, talents, uh, the tolerances in a, in a big building. So if you could somehow or other go back and have all of your print strategy changed because once the foundation went in, the, they could see that they were off by you know, uh, 0.5% in their X and 0.3% in their Y, that we could actually just adjust the print file. And the guys who are doing the electrical could adjust their electrical runs. And the guys who are doing the, the beams across beams for a wooden floor or a wooden roof could adjust their uh, parts and mm -hmm. that's kind of where we see uh, the BIM and the whole uh, digital manufacturing world 
uh, coming together in, in the construction industry in the future. Yeah, it is fascinating how so many different technologies are like culminating together um, and they almost depend on each other to mm -hmm. maximize each other's efficiency. You're building a whole ecosystem, right? Uh -huh. That has to uh, work together. Yeah. So your team initially was five people and have you expanded since then and taken on any employees or are you still just yeah. a five founder? Yeah, I think we're in total 10 people. Not everybody's full time. Um, uh, there's five owners who are actually active in the company. There's a couple other shareholders in the company who are not active, um, but we're hoping to get them active <laughs> eventually. Um, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, it's a growing team. It's a growing team. So, what positions are you looking to expand into right now? Are you looking to hire people at the moment? Yeah. We kind of have this funny approach to hiring, and this goes back from long before uh, the the Twenta days. Um, we tend to have a need around the company and that generally relates to us all just being swamped. And so we'll kind of put out a feeler out there that we're looking for somebody that's got a little bit of technical skills, just somebody's got a little bit of engineering skills or, and you know, we'll field different types of um, uh, job applicants. And then when we find someone we like and we think there's a good synergy, both like personality and enthusiasm, and then obviously they've got a resume that shows some experience that's somewhat relevant or comparable to what we're doing, then we bring them on the board and then we kind of let them figure out how they can best contribute. And so it's, it's kind of almost always like just a relief of the load of all the other overworked employees. So that's kind of how we hire. So it's not like we specifically seek uh, you know, we need a finite element analysis engineer. You know, we got four guys who can do finite element analysis, but they don't have the time to do it. <laughs> so uh, we could hire a guy to do finite element analysis, and then we don't need these guys to do that anymore, and they can jump on that other stuff that they're doing. Or a guy shows up and says, hey, I'm really good at troweling concrete. I can do all of your slab work. And then that makes it so the guys who do finite element analysis don't have to trowel concrete anymore. <laughs> So it's a, it's kind of, it's how you grow a small company in all honesty. Exactly. Yeah. Anyone who feels like they could contribute should maybe send their resume over. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And we, we, we have received quite a few. There's, there's a lot of interest out there and a lot of uh, oh, yeah. great applicants, to be honest. Um, yeah. You know, um, we get a lot of resumes. That's quite flattering, to be honest. We like to know that people want to work with us. Mm -hmm makes us feel like we're on the right track a little bit. For sure, especially I think all engineers want to work on something new. Like mm -hmm. people go to engineering school either to make a lot of money or to work on high tech, cutting edge stuff. And you guys are in that realm. So I think it makes a lot of sense that you're going to attract a lot of talent. Yeah. So, sometimes it's just people who know that we snowboard at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Normally they only get told that at the interview. Now Jarrett knows. <laughs> yeah, good. So does anything else you want to go over, Jarrett? Or feel like uh, we hit the mark? Yeah, I think we, we talked about a lot of stuff. This is a really good conversation. You guys brought up a lot of things that I haven't talked about in in my other conversations, which I think is gonna like add a lot of value. And I'm glad that you didn't do it at a desk. It's good that it's in this like <laughs> outdoors environment. Well, we're really nervous that the footage we I, shot for you is even going to be usable. I was going to say, w withhold that until the, you get the footage. Yeah. and uh... <laughs> Even if it ends up just having to be the Zoom call without the again in two days. All right. Well, thank you guys for the time that you gave me. We had a, I had a great time talking to you guys. Uh, really hoping that I can make it up there and see the work you guys are doing. I'll be in touch with you about that. And, and until then, I guess I, I'll keep following your progress. And it looks like you guys are up to great stuff.